Welcome to Tune In Tuesday, Phase 2, Old Testament History. For the foreseeable future, we're going to be in the Old Testament, and I plan on covering it in as much detail as I can. Again, doing a quote-unquote core dump <laughs> of what I have learned in order to provide a foundation to build upon so that those who build after me don't have to rebuild or relearn, but can build even higher and more ornately and beautifully. Tonight begins phase two of the next Reformation Church teachings. The research and teaching task for phase one, the seven ones of original Christianity has been completed, and that is moving into the editing and publishing task. Transcriptions are being completed, and I have to be involved with editing and working with my co-teachers, as we talked about in a few words during the warm-up period. <laughs> I will be involved in both phases one and two, which is going to take a significant portion of my time, but it's got to be done. So thanks for your support, and please pray for me. I had to really push with researching the One Hope and the One Faith classes to have enough finished material to teach come Tuesday night, because those were the two areas of the seven ones that I had not spent as much time in prior research. I, of course, knew the keys and, and all the other work that I had done on the other seven ones, and because of their interrelated nature, it cast conforming and congruent light upon the areas in the faith and the hope subjects that still had shade. And God came through every week with new and exciting insight. <laughs> there is a lot of purple smoke indeed. But I could not keep up that level of work to develop an entirely new phase two teaching series and also work on editing the books for phase one on top of that i wouldn't have enough time or mental stamina to keep the quality of the work up there where it needs to be so this is what i've figured out number one i've already taught old testament history about a dozen times all over the united states and i have the recordings so i can run them through our transcription program and have the basis for this teaching in phase two. Then of course, since I'm going to be going deeper, I'm gonna add more to that original transcription. Consequently, that's gonna save me time and work that I can redirect into the editing part of phase one. Then the second thing, I was pushing to finish during phase one. I wanted to get all the material out into the public therefore we taught up to two hours every tuesday night with a short break in between well i am going to cut back to one hour per tuesday night teaching of course <laughs> unless i have a co-teacher or, or get inspired that also will save me time that i can devote to editing phase one material and it's also going to be easier on you guys. I know that some folks listen to this teaching more than once during the week because the teachings are so concentrated and because sometimes they have new material in them. So this will allow you to stay up with me better. Occasionally, of course, I reserve the right to go longer, but if I get inspired, you know how that, how that goes. So God may, may spoil these plans with a few surprises because I'm not going to tell him no. I promise to teach only one hour. <laughs> Except tonight, um, I am going to have two parts for tonight. This part, and then I'm going to make an assignment for you. So the third thing, I'm going to involve several guest teachers who are going to teach their specialties and I'm sure that they'll do a better job on those things than I could do. So I'm going to devote my time for prep into phase one during the weeks that they're going to teach. So that will help me do both phase one and phase two work. 
Now, of course, this all could change if somehow I could go full-time ministry and retire from my computer com consulting job. So you can pray for that, for sure. But right now, I'm good. I'm working on a project in which I do desktop computer support for a nationwide corporation. And I can do everything from my home office, computer, connecting to PCs all over the United States via the Internet. My bosses are believers and know about the work that I do in my ministry. They tell me I'm a walk and talk and miracle, having survived COVID. And they're blessed supporting me, and they give me work that's not too physically taxing while I'm still recovering. But even though I love my secular job, <laughs> we all know what I should be doing. So this all could change if somehow I could go full-time ministry and retire from my computer consulting job. As Roberto Martinez and Rene Fretz are familiar with my phrase that I say during our trustee meetings for the next Reformation Church, I say, we'll see how far this goes, which of course means let's see how far the Lord takes us, all right? Now, for some phase one news. Most of the seven ones teachings have been transcribed. There have been a couple people who have volunteered to do that, and so that's moving along very well. After that, I've already spoken to other folks who want to help with proofreading, but everything's still hanging on me. I've got to edit the transcripts into book form. We talked about that a little bit in the warm-up meeting. So right now, that's needed especially with the first few classes that I taught that were taught in a more conversational, informal manner. Plus, you know, <laughs> I'd say right or okay a lot. Eh? And those transcriptions are word for word. So that might drive somebody nuts in book form. <laughs> so I got to edit that out and restructure it a bit. I already have four books partially done. Plus, I need to footnote things and all that other formatting stuff that's needed. That's going to take some time, but the world needs this stuff yesterday. So, because of that, I decided to get it out there any way I could. So, R Roberto Martinez and Rene Fretz and I got together, we spoke about this, and I got their votes as trustees to do the following. I am releasing the transcripts in their crude form right now to biblical Unitarian ministers all around the world for them to use in their research and teaching, free of charge, no strings attached, no obligations expressed or implied. I've already sent out half of the transcripts to several ministers in South America and Africa with the explanation that they're free for them to use with no obligations back to me. I told them they can even disagree with some things that's okay with me, but I want to get the research in their hands as soon as possible for them to go over it, put it into their own words and languages, French, Spanish, to answer questions, to bless and inspire, and to energize their ministries and for them to teach it. I told them that they are in raw form and books will be coming out later. And I've already gotten back thank yous from South America and Africa. One minister said it was like a spiritual bomb. Another remarked about how much God had given me in my ministry. And of course, that's because I give it away freely. I teach what he gives me and he gives me more to teach and it snowballs. Right now, it's been sent to ministers in South America, Africa, and India, and it's branching out from there. I've contacted uh, a biblical Unitarian minister in Pakistan. I'm awaiting his response. I just don't want to shove this at everybody. I want them to want it, but um, I know there are more candidates out there, speakers of different languages, that I need to send these to including ministers here in North America. So I'm telling you now, we are shifting into a higher gear. And I'm telling you now, 
Thanks for your prayers and support, because I couldn't do this without you and your help. And also, if any of you know of other biblical Unitarian ministers, especially those who are out there on their own building their ministries anew, who might be blessed by this stuff, talk to them, see if they want me to send them this stuff. All my research, all seven ones, no strings attached. I know there are some other outfits out there like 3 John 1-9 portrays, but there are others who are interested to see what others have done, and I still don't advocate imposing, though, on other ministries, so that's why I work with their leaders. I'll work with them to the extent that we agree upon and not intrude beyond that. And since these things are all written out, they'll be easier to use in transcript form and take less time to search than listening to recordings. And let them know if they have questions or added insight to contact me. Like I've said before, I don't own this stuff. It's God's word. Many of the keys were given to me effortlessly in flashes of inspiration. And so it's obvious they are gifted, so it's obvious I have to gift them further. So, hallelujah, sock it to you. So that's, that's that. So now with a drum roll and a cymbal crash, I'm ready to commence phase two of the next Reformation Church Old Testament history, our ecclesiastical heritage. Session one, introduction. Many of us came from a epistles-centric ministry. Other churches are gospel-centric. And even others, Book of Revelation-centric. But I want to be whole Bible-centric. Sure, we need to major on our era and the things that are written to us as Christians. But when we understand what went before Christ and Christianity, we can better place the things that are written to us in context. But since we were focused upon the epistles, many of us learned Greek so we could study them further. Well, what about the other 80% of the Bible? That's why I'm encouraging you parents out there who have teenagers that are blossoming. If any show a proficiency for studying language, you might consider recommending they study Hebrew and or Aramaic because we need more Christian Biblical Unitarian scholars in that area. I'm also going to be inviting several teachers to help me with this material, each teaching their research and specialty. So didn't I say this will be comprehensive? Yep, it's going to be in depth. So fasten your seat belts, or in the case of Old Testament history, gird your loins. <laughs> And even though airplanes weren't invented, make sure your tray tables are in upright position because we're taking off. The tower has given us clearance and we're taxiing to the runway. What have I done? I said to myself when I was sitting in the basement of the student union at the end of my first year of college. I was pulling an all-nighter for an analytical chemistry final. I got an A's my first year in college, but I realized that I hadn't reached any of my goals because I had left my hometown three days after graduating from high school because I just wanted to get away from there and all those people because <laughs> I've been treated so unfairly my whole life. I've been bullied so severely while in school. I just wanted to leave them all behind and forget them and move out and start a new life anywhere else but there. So I got away as soon as I could. But after a whole year in a new city, hundreds of miles away, among total strangers, I still had the same problems I had before. <laughs> it seemed I brought my problems with me. Still, I had no close friends. I still had no meaning in my life. I still had not reached any of my personal goals that I had left home to find. I wondered if my effort had been worth it. I started thinking about people whom I knew who had lived to be over 50 years old and, and they still had not achieved any of their dreams. I didn't want to grow up and be like that. It was then that I decided that instead of running away from my problems, that I would go back and face them. 
So I decided to go back to my hometown and attend college locally. And it wasn't very long after that, while at the University of Toledo, I attended my first Bible fellowship, got interested in the Bible, and it completely changed my college focus from science, physics, and chemistry, and my life changed radically. I got into studying and researching the Word, became a missionary, and God taught me how to genuinely interact with people. I did find meaning in my life then. I was with people who loved me and respected me. And so now I believe and work and live to inspire, to teach, to kindle growth, and to change people's lives by the truths that I have found through researching the Bible. So, my question to you tonight is, what have you done? What can you do? What do you want to do? This is a class on Old Testament history. We're going to learn about the lives and achievements of many great men and women of God who achieved great things, who quote unquote made it into the Bible. There have been millions and millions of believers who have lived upon the face of the earth throughout time. Yet, there have only been a select few who made it into the scriptures to be mentioned therein. They either made it because they did something really good, or they did something really bad. <laughs> Whoa, Nelly. Were they special? Or were they just folks like you and me who decided to make a difference? I believe the latter was the case. They did what they did because they rose up and God then took notice. They didn't fear. Instead, they decided to do something. They believed God to do tremendous things, being at the right place at the right time, and they changed history. I'm reminded about what Mordecai said when he encouraged Esther. He said, who knows whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? He motivated her to action, assuaged her fears, and she and God saved the Jews from total genocide. Therefore, like Esther, their lives and acts became great examples for all the rest of us who presented with the same opportunities could have done the same things. By their acts, they got into the Believer's Hall of Fame. You and I, being Christians, have majored on the New Testament. Most of us have come to know and love God through our knowledge of the New Testament. But you have to realize the Old Testament is over 80% of the Bible. That's amazing. And it's all revelation too. Revelation straight from God. Just as much as in the New Testament, which we love and study. And those clean pages in the Old Testament with no notes written on them are as much God's Word as the New Testament pages which are falling out of our Bibles because we, we've worn them out by turning there all the time. Since the Old Testament is just as much God's Word as the New, we can't exist spiritually by just reading the New Testament only. You see, we need to have a full spiritual diet. Because what would happen to you if all that, that you ate was beans? <laughs> well, first of all, we wouldn't want to be in the same room with you. <laughs> but if all you ate was just one thing, you wouldn't have a balanced diet. That's unhealthy. You understand? So, of course, I know the epistles are in the New Testament, and they're written to us, and they have the things that are in our Christian era that we need to be knowledgeable of and responsible for. Okay? That's very important. Absolutely. Well, what about the Gospels? Oh, there's many gems in the Gospels. We see how Jesus Christ walked. There, and we see how amazing he was. There, and we learn that everything that came out of his mouth was profound. He was amazing. He was the Son of God the paragon of our species. 
We can't exist as healthy Christians without partaking of the Gospels. Well, the Old Testament also is very important. So we need to have a balanced diet. So when we get into the Word and grow as believers, we, do, we need everything. The New Testament Gospels, the Epistles, the Book of Revelation, and the Old Testament. So we can have a balanced spiritual diet. Now, there are several themes that run through the whole Old Testament. The first theme is the chronological record. Normally, when we deal with something that's history, this is what you may think would be the main agenda. The generic approach to history is dealing with the timeline, the chronological events, who did what, where, when, but I also am concerned with the why. There's a lot of learning that comes in the why. And also, very importantly, the how. Because if this was written so that we'd learn from it, from its examples, the who, what, where, and when is useful, but the why and the how gives us something definitely that we can identify with. So that's the chronological record. The next theme is the genealogical record. The major genealogy is the Christ line, but you have all the other genealogies too. Now, I know we've all tried to read the Bible and got going and ran into those genealogical sections, who begat who begat who, but those are real people. They were real believers like you and me. And they had hopes and fears. They had families and spouses and children. They had jobs and people they cared for and dreams and expectations, just like you and me. But everyone that made it into the Bible made it in for a reason. So don't skip over those genealogies because sometimes there are some gems buried in there. But we also have to realize that the Jews were remarkable. They lasted long enough to give us the Messiah. So we need to respect them and be thankful for them because God knew that of all the families on the earth that this one would do the job. And that was not easy because once it was known that through them the Christ would come, they were in the adversary's crosshairs, and he never gave up trying to wipe them out. And after the Messiah came, he's kept up the persecution out of spite. The next theme in the Old Testament is the spiritual record. I'll be going over these in more detail when appropriate. But the, the spiritual record involves the spiritual impact and significance of their lives in the Old Testament and their deeds. You see, there are some things in the Old Testament that are symbolic, not everything, but there are some things that have symbolic meaning. And when you understand that and look for it, things can open up. For example, one could teach a whole class just on the tabernacle. You know the tabernacle was, right? It was the portable temple. It had everything that was later in Solomon's temple, like the Ark of the Covenant, the altar of incense, the table for the showbread, etc. And wherever the pillar of cloud moved, the children of Israel had to move when they were in the desert. So they had to disassemble the tabernacle and everything they owned, all their tents, and then the cattle too and everything, they followed the pillar of the cloud wherever it went until it stopped. And then they reassembled the camp and set everything back up with the tabernacle right in the center of camp. In the Old Testament, it shows how they had the layout of the city where all the tribes were situated in the four directions of the compass from the tabernacle in the center. The things in the tabernacle and what they did there were symbolic 
of the coming Redeemer. Even the materials and the colors of the items in the tabernacle were significant. So one could do a whole class just on researching all the different elements of the tabernacle and showing how it was a prophecy picture of the coming Messiah. That's part of the spiritual record. But also another element in the spiritual record is Jesus Christ the Red Thread. You've heard of that, right? The Christian Family Fellowship Ministry has their logo with a red thread in it representing that, Jesus Christ. He is mentioned in every book of the Bible in one way or another, symbolically or literally. He's the subject of the word. And so I'm going to point out that in the elements of the red thread when we look at each book of the Old Testament. The next theme is the legal record. Now, in our administration, the greatest revelation to the church is the great mystery. All those fulfillments and changes and secrets that came in the rushing mighty wind of Pentecost. It's a shame that many Christians don't even know that exists. And then, on the other hand, there also are some who think they know all about it, <laughs> but really don't, because there's far more about the great mystery than Christ in you, and that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise through the gospel. Those of you who have had the Marvelous Mystery Tour class, or the Rediscovering Original Christianity class, or the One Body of Original Christianity classes, they realize that. Huh. There's far more to the mystery than we can imagine. Part of that is how to practically apply it by walking in the one body, functioning with our ministries, and working with one another. That's how to apply the great mystery, how to act on it. I believe the great mystery appears, or some element of it appears, or one associated term or another of it is on every page of the epistles just like little tips of icebergs sticking up. And there's individual and collective aspects. That theme pervades our administration. So just like that theme pervades in the New Testament, the same was true in the Old Testament. The believers needed to be knowledgeable of the law and all of its ramifications. That was what was written to their administration. Therefore, a very great theme throughout the Old Testament was the law of Moses. And finally, the last theme is the Believer's Hall of Fame and Shame. Now, many times when people teach history, they focus on the timeline. So-and-so did such and such on such a day. And ho-hum, <laughs> you know, pretty much people would fall asleep listening to all that stuff. Well, I don't prefer to teach Old Testament history like that. We'll see that the real impact of the Old Testament is the believers' hall of fame and shame as examples. Because those people made it into the Bible for a reason. The Bible says they were written about for our examples. So I'm going to try to bring them to life the best I can. I've taught many Old Testament history classes. I started out as an assistant for Reverend John Shane Height. He still teaches Old Testament history with the Spirit and Truth Ministry, but my class is not a clone of his, although I learned a lot of valuable information from him. Uh, as you know from my other classes, I don't copy anyone, but I want to publicly credit John for his influence upon me because of his great work in the Old Testament and other subjects. And those of you who have had both classes will see some similarities. My class is a long class too, which I have traveled around the USA and taught over two weekends. But this is a different venue on Tune In Tuesday. 
Consequently, because we are not, because uh, we are on the internet with Zoom, I'm not going to be limited by time and space. <laughs> Therefore, I plan on being very comprehensive, like I have in my other classes. We also may do some spin-off classes, like something on intelligent design, or proverbs, or even the Book of Job. We're going to see where this goes for this first scripture in this class. I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, please. Please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and all did eat the same spiritual meat and all did drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed and that rock was Christ of course that last phrase contains a metaphor that rock represented Christ now this is real interesting it says that they did all eat the same spiritual meat you see they all did drink the same of the spiritual rock and the spiritual drink so there's a spiritual meat a spiritual drink and a spiritual rock you see well those are figurative they're symbolic we talked about that in the one baptism class they were part of a, of the spiritual theme. And so it says they were all baptized on Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So when they crossed over the Red Sea, did they have a big baptismal ceremony? <laughs> no. Hey, they were busy hot footing it across to get away from the Egyptians. So that's figurative too. Later on, when they followed the cloud around, did they stop every 10 feet and baptize somebody? No, they had to conserve water in the desert. <laughs> but it says that they were all baptized. So here you see the spiritual record. There's a figurative significance here. These are metaphorical. Type and anti-type. All right? Not everything's like that, but some things. That's the spiritual record. It is proof that you can spiritualize some things. So, there are some things that are symbolic, but not everything. Because our basic hermeneutic rule is that we ought to understand the Bible literally whenever and wherever possible. But there are some places that it's obvious that it's got to be figurative. So, we should try first to read the passage literally. And if it doesn't quite make sense, then we can look for the existence of figures of speech. But... Figures of speech are not haphazard. They're not vehicles to transmit one's theology. They are an attribute of ancient communication, and there is a science to them. To discern that, one must inspect the other examples of whatever figure we think is represented and see if what we are investigating fits that same pattern. Because we're modern folks, from the outside looking in when it comes to figures of speech because we modern speakers don't use them as much or in the ways that the ancient people did because you see back then when speakers used a figure of speech to embellish or frame their content they expected their listeners to recognize that figure and interpret what they said Therefore, figures of speech have to fit recognizable, established patterns that would echo in the minds of the listeners and therefore communicate the intent of the speaker accurately. So guess what? <laughs> the adversary threw a monkey wrench into the machine because it's well known that in the second and third centuries after Christ, the early church went off the deep end into mystical interpretation. Over-spiritualization, over-spiritualization is what I call it. In which they try to make everything figurative. If you read some of the works of Oregon, 
from Egypt. I mean, he was very strange. He had some very spooky ideas. <laughs> but even in Jewish literature, the rabbinic literature of that time got into over-spiritualizing stuff. It was a trick to bury the knowledge. I think they went far afield of what the author intended. Now, I think the key to understanding the spiritual record is that the spiritual theme centers around Christ. That's the cross check. The spiritual record centers around elements of Christ. And we see that here with the spiritual drink and the spiritual rock. That rock represented Christ. The rock that they drank out of represented Christ. Also, like I said, the elements of the temple and the tabernacle foretold the coming Messiah, as did other seminal events in the Old Testament, like the Passover, the Exodus. They foretold of the coming Christ, different aspects. So I don't advocate going too far into the spiritual uh, spiritualization of things, because if you go off into Never Never Land, somebody's going to have to come and pull you back. Otherwise, you're going to get lost. So, let's continue on in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 5. <clears throat> but with many of them, God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now, these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Well, that play was not eh, what we think of play. Neither let us commit fornication. That's what the play was. As some of them committed and fell in one day, three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt the Lord, as the text says there, not Christ. As some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. If you want to check that out, you can look at Barry's Greek interlinear, where it definitely says, tempt the Lord, in uh, verse 9. All the critical texts agree, and the note in the apparatus at the bottom of the page says, G-L-T-T-R-A-W. That stands for all the different Greek texts that were in existence at the time that Barry's Interlinear was published. Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Tregellis, Alford, and Wordsworth. So, the word Christ was just another orthodox forgery to pump their theology. So, neither let us tempt the Lord, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they're written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world, the end of the age, are come. So this fits with the Believer's Hall of Fame and Shame theme. They happened for our examples. And so now, we're ready to go on and understand the next verse. 1 Corinthians 10:12. Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This verse has been misunderstood by some who have used it against believers who are trying to take a stand for God. Oh, you better not be too confident. God might throw you for a loop. You better not be too sure now. You never know what God's will is. You better be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. <laughs> bah! <laughs> no, the word stand there can take an object or not. For you English buffs, it can have a direct object or stand alone. The direct object is the word in the sentence that receives the action of the verb. Like, John threw the ball to Tom. John is the subject. 
the subject does the action of the verb. That the ball is what the action of the verb acted upon. It was thrown. So that is the direct object. All right. Then Tom, John threw the ball to Tom. Tom is the indirect object. That's the recipient of the direct object. That's how it works. So the word stand can have a direct object. And in English terms, grammar, that's called being transitive, having a direct object. Like they stood something up on end, right? They stood up the statue. That is transitive. Or she stood up her date. <laughs> there the word statue or date is the direct object of the verb stood up. Now, sorry for you non-English speakers. To stand up a date means that a man or woman would break their promise to go out on a date with the other and fail to show up <laughs> at the arranged place and time. That's to stand up a date. But also stand can be intransitive without a direct object. And so the Greek dictionaries say that this particular word, stand, when it has a direct object, means something slightly different than when it doesn't. So, if it is intransitive without a direct object, it means to stand on one's own or to stand one's ground. So here in verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. There's no direct object there for stand. It is intransitive. So it actually is saying, let him who thinks he can stand on his own without the admission or aid of the examples in the Old Testament, let him take heed lest he fall. That's what it means. Therefore, we need to know this stuff. We should not try to stand on our own without the benefit of all these Old Testament examples. See, that's what that verse means. It doesn't mean if somebody's declaring, I'm strong in the Lord, I'm standing on the word, God's with me, and then <laughs> some distractor comes along and warns, be careful, take heed lest you fall. See, that's not recognizing the grammar. You understand? It's like those people, they say, be careful what you pray for, because you might just get it. <laughs> well, they imply that in the total opposite way, faith killers. So here, this means to stand on your own without the benefit of the Old Testament examples. So we need to study the Old Testament. Those things are for our learning. And then we get to a very important verse. The next verse in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Wow. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. This is a tremendous lesson. It follows right after, wherefore, let him think that he stands without knowing the Old Testament. Take heed lest he fall. Verse 13 declares, there is no temptation taken you, but is such as such as is common to man. And God's faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. This verse is great. First of all, there's no temptation taken you, but is such as is common to man. The old adversary, he tries the old divide and conquer method on us. He tries to isolate us and make us think we're all alone with no help available. It's one of his big lies. Oh me, oh my, no one's ever had it so, so bad. Woe is me, woe is me. 
So many times we get in trouble and we think we're really in the soup and we're tempted to think, oh, it's so bad, nobody, nobody's ever had it this bad. And the adversary is whispering in our ear, give up. You'll never win. You're finished. You'll never get out of this situation. Well, that's not true. There are other people who have had it and beat it. God helped them get out of it. He did it for the Old Testament believers. And he'll do it for you because he's no respecter of persons. So don't separate yourself and think, oh, woe is me. Oh, me, oh, my. There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Wow. <laughs> Somebody somewhere else has had the same problem at some time. And then it says, but God is faithful. And that is tremendous. God is faithful. God's faithfulness echoes throughout the word. He's committed himself to a book. He will abide by his word, and he's faithful. The adversary ain't. He's a liar. But God is faithful. And that's not just 99%. It's 100%. God is faithful. If you do a study of the word faithful, it will take you to Psalm 89, where the word faithful is repeated seven times. So that's the faithfulness psalm. Our God is the faithful God, not the other God. Our God is the faithful God. He promises to bring his word to pass. He stands by his promises. Therefore, we can count on him. Boy, that's great to know in times of temptation, isn't it? Look at Psalm 89. Let's go there for a bit. Psalm 89, verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. You know, when you sing, you say it over and over and over again, and you rejoice with it. You sing it. It's part of praise. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, Mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. He wrote it across the sky. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. And the heavens shall praise thy wonders, O Lord, thy faithfulness also in the congregation of the saints. For who in the heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? God is greatly to be reverenced in the assembly of the saints, and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee, or thy faithfulness round about thee? Goes on and on about that. So back in Corinthians, it declares, Who will not allow you to be tempted above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. Well, how many of you are parents? Well, do you let your kids go out in the street? Why? Because it's not safe out there, right? Huh. Would you put your two-year-old in a hockey game? Huh. He'd probably end up being the puck. <laughs> you wouldn't do that, would you? Of course not. You'd protect your kid. You'd shield them from things that are too big for them, wouldn't you? Well, what about the greatest parent that ever was? God our Father. He does that for us. And he does a great job of it. He will not allow us to be tempted above that which we are able, 
but will, with the temptation, make a way to escape that we may be able to bear it. God is faithful, 100%. Hallelujah. Everyone's worried about temptation and calamity, which, you know, temptation is a temptation not to believe. It's a temptation to violate the word. But let's turn this around. It says God gets involved so that we may be able to bear it, right? So let's look at it a different way. The very fact that we are in a situation is proof that we can overcome it because if it were too big for us, God would protect us from it. You understand what I'm saying? Wow, that's such a great comfort at times of temptation because many times when people realize they're in the soup, they're like a deer in the headlights. Oh my gosh, what's going to happen to me? Oh no, oh no. And they freeze. They're not looking for deliverance right then. They're in the grips of the problem, you see? But if this promise is really true, the very fact if God won't allow you to be tempted about what you're able, but will with the temptation make a way out, the very fact that we are in a situation is proof we can overcome it. Because if it were too big for us, he would not let it happen. Deliverance, therefore, is proven to be available. Wow, that's reassuring. We have a faithful God who works. Well, hallelujah, sock it to you. Well, wait, wait a minute. We're not being socked to, okay, God, because God protects us, huh? All right? But the very fact you're in a situation is proof you can overcome it. I'm serious. Even as bad as what happened to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what they faced, they stood strong and would not bow to Nebuchadnezzar's golden image. So therefore, the next time you find yourself in trouble, don't look at the situation like a deer in the headlights. Look for the deliverance. He will, with the temptation, make a way to escape. I guarantee it. No, wait, God himself guarantees it. Deliverance will be there he is faithful, and we see that throughout the Old Testament examples. He will make a way where there seems to be none. In the Old Testament, we see account after account, record after record, of people who believed just that, and God came through. Boy, that was documentation of wondrous, miraculous deliverance that made it into the book for our example. Therefore, we're going to cover accounts of the great believers in the Old Testament, and we're going to learn their life lessons, what made them tick, and what ticked them off. <laughs> How they did what they did, so that we can garnish from their example those things that we need to learn for us to succeed. And I'm going to try to make them alive and real, make them come off the page, so we can see what they were really like. Now, in the last few minutes, cover a couple things. With the chronological record, like I said earlier, the timeline, that's the usual perspective that we look for when teaching about history. I'm going to be giving some dates and events in the Old Testament to the best of knowledge I have now. For example... Adam and Eve in Genesis 3 is 4064 B.C. We don't know how long they were faithful in the garden, but 4064 B.C. is when mankind's timeline begins. Now, I know what the scientists say. Remember, I was a science major in college before I got into the Bible. In fact, I refused to take any humanities courses 
I was taking physics, organic chemistry, and geology all at the same time in my sophomore year at the University of Toledo. <laughs> the college had to force me to take some humanities courses. So I, I know what the scientists say, but we're going to cover how the Bible and true science fits. I say true science because in many cases, science is as much a religion as theology is. If you dare to look, you'll see that there are factions in politics and archaeology and medicine and science that behave a lot like religious denominations. And they have ideas that are so pervasive and accepted that they prevent analysis from concluding any other way. And thus the evidence for the real truth gets misinterpreted or worse, even overlooked. So from my standpoint, you know, I've seen too much to question God's existence. I've seen too many miracles, too many signs, too many events, which could only be spiritually induced for me to question whether there's a spiritual realm or not. In fact, I think the God of this world has made it easier to discern him than for us to see the glory of God. If you have taken notice lately, huh, the adversary is still in control of this place. And it's all part of his lust for worship. So I already know that God exists. So my assignment is how to combine true science and the Bible. These dates are taken from my research in my biblical chronology class that I taught in 1977. That was supported and supplemented by research by E.W. Bullinger and another scholar, Edwin R. Thiel. T-H-I-E-L-E. If any of you have ever tried to work the dates in Kings and Chronicles, you'll tear your hair out. <laughs> well, Theo puts it back in. <laughs> For example, Kings and Chronicles give all kinds of promising chronological information. Such and such a king reigned for so many years. His reign began in such and such a year of the other king in the other kingdom. So we might think, wow, Here's all this chronological information. I'll just get a piece of graph paper out and figure it out. Well, after about the first two or three kings, it starts going out of whack. And if you keep trying, you'll end up like me with no hair. <laughs> well, Edwin R. Thiel figured it out. He figured out their calendar. And what's really cool is he demonstrated how the word speaks on its own behalf. He approached it inductively and let the word speak. The Hebrew people had a different culture than us. They told time and even counted different than we do. And the word shows us how they did, if we don't doubt it. Here's another example. Can you imagine doing multiplication using Roman numerals? Ouch. <laughs> but they did it fine. All the great feats of Roman engineering were figured out using Roman numerals. So it's definitely possible that the Hebrews could have counted in a different way. It's like one can count the cracks in between the keys in the piano, or one can count the keys, right? Well, if you count the cracks, you'll end up with one extra. <laughs> we have a session or two we're going to cover that. Reminetti said he was interested in that. Hopefully he'll be able to keep his hair. <laughs> Another thing we have to deal with in our modern culture is humanism. Up till about 100 years ago, the United States was a true Christian nation. The Bible was widely read and even taught in public schools. Many of the universities today that are secular started out as biblical. The Bible was read to teach children how to read. But we've drifted away from our roots, and now we have to deal with another religion called humanism that's being promoted in all of our colleges, or many of them. Instead of God being God, man is God. The epitome of all that is Star Trek mentality. That's a fantasy about a future in which man has solved all the world's problems. Consequently, in the past century, there's been a systematic rejection of God. 
People talk about the separation of church and state. Well, it was not intended as a separation of God and state. If you realize what they were facing in the 1500s through the 1700s, you'll understand. Because many countries had an official religion and sponsored one church denomination as the state religion. And it was very oppressive. So many people braved the hazardous journey across the ocean to come to the 13 colonies, which later became the United States, so they could worship God as they pleased without oppression from the church and state combined. Consequently, when our nation was founded, there was to be no state-sponsored church. There was a separation of the organized church and state. That's what it was supposed to be, not a separation of God and state. The misunderstanding of that has taken on a life of its own and morphed into something so grotesque it would shock our founding fathers. I'm sure they'd say, oh, how could you be so stupid? When I grew up, our years were B.C. and A.D., before Christ and Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord, A.D. Well, of course, these humanists didn't like the word Christ having to do with anything. So now we have B.C.E., before the Common Era, and C.E., the Common Era. Well, heck with that. <laughs> I still use B.C. and A.D., but also wherever I can, I'm going to note when biblical events synchronize with secular history. For example, the traditional date for the founding of Rome was about 30 years before the northern kingdom of Israel was conquered by the Assyrians. One of the things that I learned when I did my research on biblical chronology is that the chronology is the backbone of history. It gives dates or date ranges to everything. And most importantly to note with the biblical chronology is that the Bible gives us all the information that we need to make an intact timeline all the way through from Adam to Malachi. We don't have to go outside of the Bible to fill in any missing information for the biblical timeline. Everything we need is here. Now, sometimes it's sparse, but it's just enough, and we just have to not doubt it. Now, of course, there are chronological records, secular ones like king's lists and clay tablets and carvings on ancient buildings or columns that have secular chronologies. For example, there was a kingdom called Assyria, which is to the north of where Damascus is today, where Iraq is now, around the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Archaeologists have uncovered stores of clay tablets, which contain a chronological record of all their kings, like a king's list. The same is true for the Babylonians, we have king's lists and court records. The same is the case for the Persians and the Egyptians. So there are intact secular histories that exist. But the Bible has its own information. And what we know to be true is that the events depicted in the Bible actually happened. They really did happen. So we're going to take a break. And after the break, I'm going to give you an assignment. 